a very good morning to one and all at the outset i santosh patil on behalf of organizing committee and management welcome you all for the two day faculty development program being conducted on 15th and 16th june 2021 by our college under the auspices of rusa scheme 2.0 as we all know that rusa that is rashtriya uchchatar shiksha abhiyan is a central government project which provides financial assistance to the autonomous colleges across the country to enhance quality and infrastructure to promote top class education in india by means of access equity excellence and exploration today's theme of the program is faculty development program and introductory session on artificial intelligence and data analytics in commerce as we all know that data analytics and artificial intelligence is an upcoming field which has entered in mainstream business processes and it has huge demand in the professionals in the field in the us and the demand is rapidly increasing in india also we have taken this opportunity to equip our teachers with this technical knowledge this program will cover various basic components of artificial intelligence and data analytics which will definitely enhance and upgrade our knowledge and skills so we are looking forward to undergo this training program now without taking much of your time uh, and to proceed with the program i would like to invite our principal dr shobhana vasudevan ma'am to address the participants shobhana ma'am please good morning mr patil sir good morning mr kadam and uh, you are a uh, resource person from your own uh, company and my dear friends and colleagues who have assembled here today for enhancing ourselves in the field which is going to be so current contemporary and latest keeping the tradition of podar college we always want to learn and keep learning this is what is the mantra we have been promoting as a podar culture whether it is going to be student or faculty of happening around and that is going to be the purpose and objective of this particular faculty development program a short interaction with mr kadam sanjay kadam and his son who is going to be akshat kadam who is going to be the resource person for today i analyze and understood how it is going to be so relevant and important in the field of commerce and management many times this data analytics is going to be associated with something which is going to be out of our mind and is going to be something not within our reach although we individually are going to be experiencing being analyzed because we are a data for somebody else your phone number is a data for somebody else artificial intelligence is what that we are going to be using and many times that is what i was telling mr sanjay kadam that this prompting that is taking place on my telephone which is predicting what is going to be the word i am going to start type next sometimes it leads me to so many problem with spelling mistakes and other things and what i wanted to say how can i think that the artificial intelligence is going to recognize but that is what is happening my dear friends aap type karo wish you best of luck comes on the screen all you need to do is to tab it so that the best of luck appears on your screen so your mobile phone your laptop your computer he is definitely going to support the intelligence that you have but believe me no kind of machine language or machine intelligence can replace you and i we are the teachers born to give knowledge plus 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 because we are educating our students which no machine can do it but at the same time we also should learn what's happening around so that probably we may be little cautious probably we will use our intelligence much more better maybe when our intelligence is going to be supplemented by this machine and maybe we will be leading towards more productive activities especially 
when we were indulging in research activities this artificial intelligence and uh, the a kind of uh, prediction and uh, your uh, machine language and data analytics is going to help when you are going to be scientifically spirited when you want to enter in the empirical research everything should be supported by data even small bachche aap jo bolte hain abhi aisa karo kisne bataya where is the proof today about vaccine what is the validity they want data everything is going to be now data based and data need to be analyzed and the better analytics is going to lead to better results always what is the garbage in garbage out when the data is proper your outcome and the research finding is going to be the best so when you are going to talk about artificial intelligence and data analytics we the teachers must understand how to develop the data clean the data and what is the best tool for analyzing the same commerce and management along with various allied faculty definitely are going to be relying on what's happening around capturing the data analyzing it so that we are going to become intelligent enough to capture the most uncertain movement of the future i heartfully thank kadam and their company for evincing interest in taking up this initiative use of intelligence tactics with reference to our field of study and the research oriented activities that we want to undertake believe me my dear colleagues this is going to be a very important uh, topic concerning each one of us although we have been started using machine in a big way for our teaching learning but how to use the data which we have got with us student data their results their performance their evaluation our observation we have so much of data with us if we understand how to analyze it we may also transfer the knowledge to our student so in the real life environment working for a corporate or working for a company how they are going to use the data that is available to them probably our resource person will touch upon little bit of data security also and i wish all of you participate and ask questions and get clarified about all the unknown things or things which we think we know but definitely we don't know let us open up and get ourselves cleared so that this fdp definitely is going to develop us in a one more ladder up in our in initiative to reach greater heights thank you very much mr patil sir for taking up the responsibility of organizing it congratulations to the team and i wish you all the best thank you very much thank you ma'am for your cheering and thoughtful words now i will take this opportunity to introduce to you the resource person mr akshat kadam mr kadam is a cto of devlan technologies this company provides education training and career development opportunities to the students and professionals alike in the emerging areas of data sciences and analytics at devlin uh, mr akshat is currently heading technology and academic initiatives while reaching out to the higher education institutes in raising their academic levels he is an electric engineer by profession and an alumnus of indian institute of technology bombay his specialization is in computer vision he has served a research as an research scientist at a very reputed company namely sony in japan he has also contributed as a technology strategist to sony r&d's new indian subsidiary sony research india on perspective research initiatives and industry engagement in kick start of their business in the artificial intelligence solutions in india he has been conducting various program for autonomous colleges also 
under rusa scheme we welcome you sir on this occasion and now i request you to please take over the session now it's over to you akshat sir okay yeah thank you so much sant patel sir uh, for the very kind introduction and also to madam principal shobhna madam for uh, just a fantastic introduction on um, yeah the primer for this talk and also this fdp as and the background uh, behind uh, why we are doing these programs and i do not need to repeat uh, just or even stress you know, the importance of how uh, data analytics and this evolving field is going to impact every sector in industry uh, including education and how teachers are going to be uh, a very going to play a very pivotal role in shaping the next generation that is going to uh use these technologies and also benefit from them and not you know feel left behind so i feel that uh, the need of the hour for us is to uh, teach the teachers and cultivate them so that they can go ahead and impart knowledge to the next generation and that is you know the main reason that we are here today okay so welcome everybody thank you for joining today uh it's supposedly have a short session we are uh, only we only have a little bit around an hour of time so i will try to cover as much as i can today and um, i think uh, dr yeah so uh, san patel sir has already given a short introduction about me so this is just a slide i should have brought up earlier uh, but yeah this is just my brief profile i've been working as a research scientist for sony and also dabbled a bit in strategy for them so i was i and i come and i'm back here in devlon to use the same insights about the indian ecosystem to also see what innovations are possible in the education industry okay so let's uh, dive into the talk today about what we are going to be discussing and um, this is a brief agenda for the day and so we probably broadly going to be speaking upon three aspects of um, this entire discussion and i will use approximately one third of the time for each of these Uh, sections and uh, we will start with a very basic uh, essential knowledge about these fields and what are the concepts that go behind uh, these technologies so i understand that uh, most of the teachers today professors are do not have a stem background but that is perfectly fine i have designed this discussion or this session so that even a person with no background in science or technology can probably understand given the historical context and changes that we have seen so far in the last 20 30 years of time so we will take a bit uh, a dive into history how these technologies have developed and the development of these two technologies in tandem namely ai and big data why that has led to the current data science revolution that we are seeing today and what is exactly uh what happens within the role of uh, various data driven jobs so you keep hearing jobs like data scientist or data analyst or data engineer even and uh, what exactly happens in these jobs and uh, what exactly do you mean when i say business intelligence so these are terms that i have observed people in the market in the industry they use interchangeably uh, they don't often understand Uh, what exactly they mean when they say these terms uh, so i would like to give start by just touching upon you know what you should think when you think about these concepts so hopefully at the end of this short discussion today you will at least take home some good concepts that you can keep in your mind and the next time you encounter these topics you, you are talking about these topics uh, you will feel confident that uh, you understand what you are hearing or you know what you are talking about so this is just a primer i don't expect to actually teach you anything about data analytics uh, so we will end it by giving you a little bit of insight into what is happening in the market today uh, with a few use cases in commerce uh, where how uh, people are using statistics and mathematics and these tools to improve uh, business functions across so many sectors and uh, also economic and also economics broadly so we'll touch a little bit upon that also towards the end okay so let's just dive right in and uh, you can just uh, sit back and listen uh, very 
uh, you can just uh, ease in and listen in. Okay. So I will be entertaining questions uh, between sections. So if anybody has any question, please feel free to raise your hand or even uh, say unmute your mic when I'm uh, when I ask for the same. And you can feel free to ask. We can ha just have a dialogue in today's session. Okay. So let's get right into it. And uh, the, okay. So before we start, this is uh, just a short mission slide for DevLearn and. Um, the reason that we are here, we are doing these training sessions at colleges and universities is that uh, our core mission as an education company is to actually raise employability and employment standards for students across. So we have been training students who graduate from colleges and teach them uh, these advanced technologies. But uh, we realize that it is kind of a bit, bit of a wasted effort, uh, especially if you are able to tap the student right at the inception, right at the college level. And also you are able to uh, educate the teachers. If the teachers are able to upskill, uh, the economy will be able to be kickstarted much faster and the next generation will be trained even more efficiently. Okay, so moving on to the actual crux of the talk today, let's uh, dive into a little bit of uh, knowledge about AI and big data. So we'll start uh, with just talking about a little bit about the history uh, and this slide is designed to tell you about the origins of data science, but the origins of AI are very closely intertwined with uh, the development of data science as a field. So uh, originally AI as a concept was conceptualized way back in 1950s and 60s with the concept of the computer itself. But um, it was kind of dropped a little bit towards you know, one, two decades later towards the 70s because people realized that although it is easy for computers to do things that humans find difficult to do, such as uh, long division or big integer multiplication or long multiple additions, you know, anything that a calculator does that humans find difficult to do, it's easy for computers, but things that are very easy for humans, such as seeing something, recognizing a person's face, uh, you know, speaking just regular speech, it is almost intuitive for us. It is, we don't have to think much when we do these things, but for a computer, it is so much more difficult than it is for humans to do, you know, complex computer, uh, multiplication. So there was a bit of a paradox that machines, they don't learn the same way as humans and AI as a concept was dropped back then. So that was left at that point. And we go ahead and fast forward a little bit towards the late nineties when the internet began. And uh, that's when the term data mining as a concept was conceptualized by a few scientists and academicians. And uh, their the original idea was that if you have uh, a set of data available to you and you use some basic statistics on it, uh, you can try to infer some knowledge from that data, some knowledge that is not explicitly written in that data, but that data is implying. So if I am saying, for example, uh, the population of, I have a population distribution of people across a state. Now I will see that there are a lot of people, uh, in, you know, concentrated in one location and people are spread out in the rest of the state. So it is clear to me that, you know, that is a city and there is a lot of economic activity. There are a lot of opportunities uh, available in this one place, which is why people have gathered here. So that is an inference we gained. That is that the data is not saying, but it is implying to you. So data mining started as a way to uh, know this from understand these things from data as uh, you know, we started data collection across various fields. And that's how, you know, uh, data science as a field was born shortly after that, when, uh, statisticians and computer scientists, they kind they tried to use data mining within a computational framework and add statistical methods to it. So that's how the field, the typical field of data science was born. And, uh, but it was a, a field that was slowly growing. It was in its nascent stage. Now. Uh, in 2006, what happened is that the evolution of the internet went from its original 1.0, we don't usually call it 1.0, but it went to the web 2.0, 2 
which is uh, we are currently in a late stage 2.0 type of internet. And uh, this switch led to a change that, le that led to the rise of what we call today as big data. And uh, this data kept growing to an extent. And what happened is that the culmination of it was that when scientists were able to leverage some of that data into a landmark research in 2012, is when we realized that now suddenly, with the availability of so much data, AI, which was scrapped back in the 1970s, is now a viable technology because with big data, AI suddenly performs much better than it used previously was able to. And it's doing so well that it's overcoming humans in almost everything. And that is what led to the whole data science or AI revolution that we are seeing now in the past eight to nine years. And it's going to just continue from here on out. So from 2012 to 20, researches kept expanding across all fields. And today you'll see that people are using uh, AI methods and algorithms in almost any application that you can see conceivable. So that is what brings us here. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what the web is or what AI and machine learning these things are moving forward. Okay. So just to give you a brief note about what artificial intelligence is. So if I were to actually talk about, you know, AI as a topic itself and what is AI to give you insight about that, we would probably consume the entire hour, um, just to, you know, give you a sort of working understanding of it. But, uh, let me just leave it at the point that, you know, uh, when you're thinking about AI, usually, you know, people have some science fiction thoughts that, you know, uh, AI, it's completely artificial. It is futuristic. It is. Uh, an intelligence that humans cannot conceive of. And theoretically, uh, it does include that definition or that thought. But when we are practically using AI today in the industry, uh, we are limiting it to the model of intelligence that humans have used. And that model of intelligence is implemented using what we call as machine learning today. So machine learning here is for all intents and purposes, a subset, a perfect subset of AI. So all, all of machine learning is practicing AI, but all of AI doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing machine learning, but, uh, for, you know, the purposes of your interact for your understanding, it is, you know, uh, most profitable or, you know, just is simplest to consider that anything that is outside the scope of machine learning and within AI is not relevant to us you know, as a society today. So deeper within this are, you know, certain advanced machine learning concepts that we call deep learning. So they are just a subset of methods. They are only uh, a few set of advanced algorithms and methods. And the, the fascinating thing about them is that they use much more data than even machine typical traditional machine learning algorithms do. So, but on the flip side of that, Although they consume so much data, they are very complex uh, in their structure and their method. But the results that they are giving are today state of the art. Everything that you're seeing from self-driving cars to even uh, AI speech to even AI that can robots that can distinguish objects to each from each other. The best ones are using deep learning methods. So that's what uh, it's sufficient for you to understand this much for now. And uh, I'll just show you a few examples of, you know, what is the magic that these algorithms are able to do today. So uh, earlier this decade, we were trying to just scratch the surface on what is possible with, uh, you know, machine learning or deep learning, whether AI can actually beat humans at certain things that uh, we thought humans were unbeatable, such as, for example, chess or go. And uh, that was in fact done about three years ago, about 2017, 18, uh, when, uh, an AI bot actually created by Google was able to defeat the world champion at go. So here you'll see a small picture over here of, uh, what is called as a go board. So go is a game that is, um, typically many, many times more complicated than chess. If chess is, you know, an eight by eight playing field of 64 squares and, uh, if you were to mathematically device it into a model, it would be, you know, something complex. 
Go as a board itself is four times that of chess in size, and the complexity of that is much more. But uh, Google's bot was able to beat the world champion uh, in a landslide, and that's when you know our perception that you know we are uh, AI has now reached that level of quality uh, came about. And now it just three to four years later, we are finding that from a simple board game. AI is now able to play complex video games and even able to defeat the world champions in those video games. So uh, it's very difficult to understand what is happening in this snapshot that I put here. But uh, if any uh, anybody here is familiar with the online multiplayer game called Dota or League of Legends, so that is uh, a game that is extremely complex. It needs strategy, multiplayer ability, etc. And uh, uh, a company known as OpenAI was able to defeat them with just their one bot. Okay, so uh, I'll just uh, before we go a little bit deeper into what, how, how all these things are possible with AI. I just want to touch a little bit upon how big data started and came about. Now I'm I had mentioned the Web 2.0 earlier today, and um, it was I think. Uh, it is not usually touched upon. People don't talk about what happens uh, when you move from web 1.0 to 2.0. We have just always implicitly assumed that uh, this is the internet uh, that was always there. But in fact, the internet, the model of the internet before 2006, you will notice that old websites like, you know, MSN or Netscape, etc. So these were old websites, you know, completely. It was not just a design that was backward. It was also the model and it was the uh, board of the internet, which was mostly just like a digital encyclopedia. You were only using the internet as a book, but today you are using the internet as a window to express yourself, to put out your content into the internet. So now today's internet, you know, you don't just have consumers. You also have content creators. You have people, every like that you put, every comment you put out there, uh, Every time you do a video chat, every time a YouTube video is uploaded, uh, users are participating in this internet and the data, the collective data that, you know, we on people around the globe are generating is just increasing more and more. And with that, what we're having is for each person who is interacting with the internet today, uh, all the data associated with that person is growing. And this data has now grown so much that your old methods of, you know, doing statistics or mathematics or analytics, it's not enough. You just cannot process it in time. Uh, those methods are as good as, you know, a person sitting and reading uh, thousands of emails it, effectively. You need new methods and newer algorithms to even deal with this level of amount of data. So that's what happens when the internet evolved and this web switch from 1.0 to 2.0 gave us uh, big data. Now, let me just show you what happens when we mix, uh, AI and big data together. And, you know, you add multidisciplinary features and put them together into one product. So this is a landmark, um, presentation made by Google. This was three years ago. So this is relatively old when you're talking about the timeline of, you know, development of AI right now. A uh, lot of things have happened in the last three years, but let's just take a look at this. Uh, I'm sure many of you might have already, but just for the sake of everyone, we'll enjoy this, uh, this short two minute video. Now, uh, it's important to note before you look into it is that, uh, the presentation that is made on the left is a complete bot. There is no human person speaking on the right is an actual human who is picking up the phone at a local business talking. So just observe how the speech is able to handle the conversation, this bot. Okay. If anybody has any difficulty in uh, hearing the audio, please let me know. Uh, would anybody like to interject with any comment at this point? Okay. Uh, let me just proceed with the video then. Okay. Just uh, let's just watch it. Uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not able to listen to the audio. Uh, I think it's always better to keep the mask on. The hat can't be left there. You have to make sure that the mask is on. You have to make sure that the mask is on. You have to make sure that the mask is on. Mm-hmm. We're better to make it part of your normal. Yeah. Get used to it. Mm-hmm. You have to go straight, na? पेट्रोल है एक चीज एक्सक्यूज मी या प्लीज गो हेड या देयर वाज नो ऑडियो ओके वी वर नॉट गेटिंग एनी ऑडियो ओके All right. Uh, it's fine. I think uh, it may take some time to troubleshoot that issue. Uh, we, I may have to share the audio as well. Yep. Just see. All right. I'll be sure to just uh, put this video in the chat uh, later on when we're doing Q and A. But uh, I think it was also visually perceptible. uh what is happening because you have a bot that is having a real conversation with a person uh there were also some closed caption subtitles so uh we are also falling a little bit behind time so let's just push forward and the point that i'm trying to make is that they put together uh multidisciplinary fields like natural language processing uh actual real recorded human speech and uh loads of data of real conversations to train their bot and that's where we have you know the product that you're seeing and they have just kept developing it for you know even the forthcoming 3 years and uh, today you have uh, an upgraded version of this product as well so let's just proceed so i would like everyone to just note that you know we have reached this level of ai so okay moving on so i would like to just touch upon how uh, Google went about doing this. Uh, you know what exactly happens when you train a machine learning algorithm or you train something in AI. Now, uh, typically, you know, before AI and big data was like you know they ca- they came together to create our uh, state of the art algorithms today. But uh, before that, you know, if you would look at academic papers or research work, you would realize that you know. the best methods for doing anything even this speech call before you know deep learning this this level of product 10 years ago 20 years ago people were trying to do this and they were doing this not with lots of data but with lots of rules and uh, these rules or you know uh, in this particular <laughs> example you would call it a language model uh, this was designed by someone who knows a lot about language human language human speech he sat and wrote these rules we created uh, you know an algorithm a deterministic one and then you used it on input to try to get something but you know uh, the quality of that product is only limited by how good those rules are written and that is the main difference here so instead of a human writing the rules where our understanding of to what detail you need to explain to a computer how the rules work uh, is limiting our output but today what you are doing is that with lots of data and lots of examples if you are able to use a method or an algorithm so that that algorithm uh, can create the rules itself you know using the examples you know you look at the examples and tell it this is all the sort of examples you will see uh, make your rules from this and you know if a new thing comes that is outside the rules okay it may or may not work but if it's inside the rules it will likely will work if it is well designed so that is what is happening with ai and that is what these advanced algorithms are doing today so this was just to give you a little bit of understanding of what is the state of the art today and uh, because it is those large number of examples and that large number of data that is available now to us yeah. uh is why all of this is possible in all of all sectors of industry so from yeah. travel education to it okay so this brings us to the end of our first phase of discussion um where you know uh, we put together 
AI That's and big data to talk Dora about Kana. this. Okay, so I'd like to open for questions uh, at this point. Anybody has any thought or any uh, anything you're curious about about uh, you know the what we have just shared so far? Okay, uh, I think we're good to proceed. So let's just go on. I'll uh, we'll take it to we'll go through the second uh, section of uh, things and maybe some more questions might pop up. Okay, so moving on to the next part, which is after AI and big data are doing all of these impressive things, what does that actually mean? Uh, you know, these glamorous applications are good and all, but uh, how are these, you know, technologies actually impacting businesses today? How are these technologies going to impact your a student's job, a new graduate's job today in the market. So these are a few statistics that are popping up. Uh, we've just pulled out some of the trends of what companies are looking for in these new uh, job roles that are coming in. So especially uh, what we have seen is the biggest jump in three or four, you know, typical these new jobs, which is that of that have the word data inside it. So it's typically data scientist or data analyst, engineer, and also business analyst is one that has uh, really expanded uh, in, in the past uh, about eight to 10 years, one decade. Okay. Now, uh, this growth is what is fueling the hype behind, you know, this field and this industry and uh, companies are not wrong. Although there are a lot of things that you need to tackle that, you know, as a graduate or as a teacher, you need to understand uh, what exactly is going on like what is the expectation of the company or the job when they are hiring for this role so let's just take a little a small look at that before we proceed to a few examples of that so uh, another fascinating thing you know that you would observe with these fields is that uh, the expected experience for these analytics jobs is far lesser than what you would see for you know typical you know science and technology jobs stem jobs that you will see out there so around almost 40%, that is close to half of uh, over half, in fact, of all the expectations of the jobs are for freshers or less than five years of experience. Uh, okay, here we go. This is the one. So this is, this is I think, almost 80% of all the jobs, in fact. So this is staggering. You will not find this anywhere else. Uh, any programmer or any other sort of you know, development job software uh, that we saw in the early 2000s, there, there was a lot of uh, experience requirement and, you know, students are usually stuck. I can't get, I don't have experience, so I can't get that job. I can't, I, it's difficult to get my first job, so I can't get experience. But uh, the beauty with these fields is that because the field itself is so new, the expectation of the engineer or the analyst is not much. And, you know, the industry has recognized that now. So th this is why it is a very, very ripe time for students to pick up on this and also realize that the trend is moving in this direction, right? So let's take a look at um, like the main problem that, you know, is happening over here is uh, <laughs> one big issue that we see is something we, we typically call a skill gap problem. Now, uh, what has happened is over the past few years, uh, industries and companies, they understand small, medium scale businesses, uh, any ad agency, any firm, any small company you are seeing, they know AI is here. AI will help my business and I, we should be using AI somehow, but only a fraction of them, say maybe one for 20% of all of them actually are using AI or they know what they're doing. So there is the intent. There is no ability. Now, this is where, uh, what is happening is we are lacking in terms of a public or generic education on the subject and also, you know, generic adoption. So this is happens all the time. You know, anytime a new industry pops up, a new thing happens, uh, this, this <laughs> gap is going to be there. And the key to who is going to emerge as a leader in this field or this new emerging industry is that market or that segment that manages to fill this gap as fast as possible, or, you know, is manages to provide the supply to the big demand gap that is there. So 
we have seen this in the past with uh, various other jobs and uh, we will see this you know even in the future when jobs are continue to change so uh, let's see a little bit as you know companies when they know that they want some analyst they want uh you know an accountant that understands data analysis they want an economist or a statistician that knows how the, these things so they put out certain job descriptions but uh, before you know we get to that let's just understand to give you a little bit of uh, thought process is to what exactly is doing data science does you know as a job function so you are not exactly uh you know making those complex models or those flashy products that uh, i just showed you earlier or those applications what you are doing is in the context of your company in the context of your job uh you are trying to solve very very simple problems which is uh when you go down to the lowest layer of it that is to the core problem is that there are a set of questions that in my business this is my business is so and so uh and there are certain types of questions why are certain things happening what is happening and what do i do to improve my business that is the job of a data scientist uh, from a technical side a data analyst from you know a business side or say a you know a business analyst from the pure you know management to business side uh, who talks to analysts and relays it to management so uh, the core questions is what anybody should be focusing on when you are looking at this and you know depending on what question is asked is you go into uh, what is the sort of method you will use to find the answer so in questions that are you know more uh, looking into the future that is you know what what happens next or what do we do from now this is the business now what do i do so as uh, somebody who is involved in this team what you would do is you would do something called predictive analysis with the data that is already there in the company it be calling data phone numbers anything uh, the way you have data on how people are interacting with your website uh, how people are using your app and you can try various models there are various set models even applying these will cause a lot of impact it will answer these questions and it will help the business take the right decision so another type of uh, you know models that help answering this is a prescriptive one is that uh, you're not you want to know what to do next but you also want to understand if there is a problem now okay. why is it happening on artificial intelligence and data analytics for our staff all right so uh, and the last type that you know oh, typically don't we put it in three big types is told. that uh, the final type is for descriptive analysis where we talk about uh, how many or <laughs> what is uh, happening I stop, then or what is the problem so as a data scientist you or an analyst you will be just going through the data and you will be trying to figure out okay uh, what is happening i need to find a pattern here so these are the things that you would typically be doing and, you know when you identify that pattern you will take it to your boss you will tell them hey this is the pattern uh, maybe we should work on this problem okay so these are the typical questions this is what you should have in mind so uh, let's just take a look at as an analyst what are the core features that are the core expectation of you so over here uh, there are four main expectation requirements over here that we have and um, they are typically for analytics domain knowledge program and communication so uh, me just listing them out is not going to help so let me show them to you in the context of uh, say something like a job description so we i have just picked up two you know uh, job descriptions from some big companies uh, that hire a lot uh, you know in these fields so let's just see uh, we don't have to read through the whole thing but i'll just help show you that how these four skills are common in many different job descriptions and how they reflect in all of them now uh, let's just look at this amazon's uh, job description here and they have they are asking for the same four things they just using different words and their application is different and depending on what their domain is what their department is uh, the expectation is different so you will need to do learn the same four things but if you're going into a different domain you will probably need knowledge in that domain if i am going to be working at an ad agency as say 
their accountant or as a uh, a growth analyst or anybody any brand manager if i'm working i should understand the ad business i should understand uh, where ads work uh, okay they work on social media uh, what is my company's involvement with all the social media platforms uh, what are my clients doing so that's how you would be uh, you will mix your domain knowledge and bring that into your job so for a different uh, field the domain knowledge will be different so domain knowledge is something that would come from experience but your analytics and programming skills and also to some extent your communication skills can be cultivated at the college level uh, through self learning through uh, you know uh, teacher student based interactions so this is important that if anybody is ever interested in getting into these fields uh, these are how you should perceive uh, your own personal development or the development of your student uh, when you know you are going through the entire curriculum for them okay so moving forward this is uh, a very heavy chart now uh, i usually uh, show this at least once to you know in all of my introductory talks because this is something that is not talk, spoken about and uh, usually what is spoken about in popular media mainstream media is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to you know data science the the glamorous part the celebrity which is you know uh, ai and deep learning which does all these fantastical things like you know uh, impressive speech conversations or you know self driving cars or those kind of things but uh, what is that is not what a company needs to, tomorrow at the ground level when you are working tomorrow when you are working the first thing that you need to secure for your organization is a source of data so that is when you would come into say instrumentation if you are having or even setting up a data source uh, be it user generated content so typically for any in the service industry that is what's going to be your data source so if you have uh, if you are doing any service if you are a tailor if you are a plumber uh, if you are just a contractor who does who connects people you would have a website uh, you will be collecting you will be putting somebody to get data from that website and the only way for you to improve here or one of the most impress, uh, impactful ways is how what is happening when people interact with my website and how i can increase that engagement so that is usually at the software level but once we go up once the organization is slightly big once you know uh, there is actually uh, there is enough data within the organization to think about okay i have so much data i don't know what to do with it i want to uh, figure out you know if there is something wrong in my current product if there is something wrong that we are doing or what can we do better that's when you would hire an analyst or you know uh, even a business analyst or uh, a scientist uh, if it is a very complex problem so uh, let's not uh, explain you know all these complicated jargon i'll just jump into what the job roles will look like so uh, what happens over here in these companies this is typically the realm of big tech or you know any startup for whom the ai or you know the the algorithm or that is their product ai is their product uh, but for most companies who don't for which ai is not their product their product is a service or it is something else they can use ai to improve their service or their product so either uh, you know you're on one side where ai is your product or you're on the other side where uh, you are using ai to enhance your product so uh, you will the uh, balance of probabilities you will likely be in the latter side and uh, unless you're going to work for a very big company say google facebook where you want to do these specific things it, you do not have to think about you know the tip or the top of the pyramid you have to be worried about what is happening over here which is uh, if i am in the middle or i am at the bottom and a software developer engineer is giving is giving me data and my boss is asking me what can we do with this i am just a simple accountant i am an economist who is uh working in this firm to improve its business output so these are the things i need to be thinking about so 
let's not dive too much into what actually happens when you do analytics or metrics, but uh, yeah, say that is probably out of the scope of today's discussion, but safe to know that uh, this pyramid is something that you really should take away from this discussion and uh, where you as a teacher, as you know, uh, a teacher of say a commerce college or, you know, in a field of economics where if you're going to be nurturing or mentoring students who are interested in going into these fields or who are, who feel that they need to know these things, how will you talk about them? Yeah. And uh, that brings us to the end of our second section. Uh, we're running quite short of time. So if there is any question on this point, we'll just uh, quickly take them up. Otherwise we can move on to the final part. Okay. Um, Santosh sir, I will just uh, request you that if there are any questions in the chat or anything that comes up, uh, please bring them up to me. Okay, sir, I have one question regarding. Sure, sure, please go ahead. Okay, nowadays many companies are you know uh, providing this cloud-based uh, servers, uh, mm -hmm. data storing server services. Okay, right. So how how safe and secure that data is once it is uploaded on the cloud computer? Okay. How how safe that data is for us? Right. So uh, the detailed answer to that question is will probably I would like to have some visual aid, but I don't have that at the moment, but let me just answer the question for you as best I can verbally. Now, um, when you talk about any cloud based storage pipeline, um, there are various steps and there are, there are securities and there are vulnerabilities to it. Now, uh, it all depends on how the cloud infrastructure is set up that is at the remote side and how your local infrastructure is set up. Now, before cloud was a concept, what would people do? If you are say, let me take your example of your college. Uh, you have a server, you have a computing system, an IT network, uh, and the server for that would typically sit somewhere in the college and that machine had to be on 24 seven. And uh, if that machine fell down or if that machine collapsed, uh, you know, your your IT network is down, probably your internet is down, probably uh, any portal or any systems, softwares that are using that depend on the server, that depend on the data storage over there, uh, they are down. But uh, with the cloud, what happens is that, again, if the machine sitting in the remote location uh, fails, you can theoretically fall. But with these big cloud enterprises, uh, what we are seeing is that there is a big uh, conglomeration and coming together of huge cloud resources by big companies. And uh, if you are investing in a very robust cloud service, so let me give the example of what say Amazon Web Services does. So AWS uses something called a distributed cloud. Now here, what they do is they set up a cloud storage space for you and they also set up a backup for you. So if uh, your primary thing falls down, there is a electricity cut, something which doesn't happen, but uh, they back up to the next. But coming to your uh, concern, which is on data security, uh, the security will depend on how the remote side is using it. Typically, the short answer for you now is that I would not worry about how enterprise companies, at least large enterprises are securing your data because they, they would encrypt it using, if they are saying that they're using two to three layers of encryption, then the company cannot see your data. They are not concerned with it or they cannot see it even if they want to, but, and it is available only to you. They will set up the storage space for you. Where is your vulnerability? Your vulnerability can be at your local point at your college, the machine where you are logging in to that cloud network, your vulnerability can be in the network itself. So uh, I would worry about those things and not worry more about uh, the cloud service that is giving you that, uh, whether it is hosted anywhere outside of India or whether it is hosted even in India. Uh, so typically depending on government regulations, et cetera, there may be, there is, there is no regulation on data right now, but you will see that there are plenty of very, very good services in cloud with data centers within India that are managing things well. Okay. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Uh, any follow-up or anything that you'd like to know about? Uh, can I uh, ask you a question? Sure. Are you able to hear me? 
Yes. Yes, uh, yes. So regards to your previous slide, I couldn't mute my unmute myself. Okay. Uh, it's on uh, A and N. That is uh, artificial neural network. You had a slide on input layer and output layer. It is a bit technical because you said that a computer cannot uh, read the face and uh, something you said before. Right. And uh, this pattern, you know, uh, AS pattern, which helps for various deep learning techniques, mm -hmm. which has mm -hmm. a pattern of uh, recognizing face, like we have biometrics, we have face reading on computers. Can you throw some lights on this? Can you follow my question? Uh, if I understand correctly, I think what you're trying to understand, uh, yeah. learn yeah. is uh, what are some applications that can help uh, you understand more about how this, the lower part of uh, these algorithms work. Is that right? Yeah, because I'm teaching e-commerce and I'm mm -hmm. and I have come across such stuff. So I wanted to understand if the time is there. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, let me do one thing. Let me take a few examples of how it's working in commerce uh, and finance. And okay. maybe we can come back to this in the final Q&A, okay. if that's okay. 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 Right. Yeah, and one more question on the misconception of, about the AI. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. So let's proceed with uh, the final part of our just talk today. We are uh, going to overshoot, but uh, let's try to keep it brief. Okay. So I'll just discuss a few examples of, uh, say, what is happening in commerce now. And uh, something, one of these things even we have been involved in as a company. So let's just get right into it. So. When you're talking about data analytics in uh, actual business conditions, uh, there are typically three types of solutions. Uh, similar to the three types of solutions to questions that we saw, uh, we have what you called uh, prediction, description, and recommendation. So the first thing on the slide that you're seeing right now is an example of prediction. So when you are, say, talking about a stock market, uh, I would like because everyone here is of a commerce background, I think it would be helpful that uh, these examples would be fixed in your head instead of, you know, anything that uh, are related to, say, my personal field of expertise. So uh, something that everybody might have heard of till by now is something called high frequency trading or even algorithmic trading. So this is a product of people starting to use algorithms to Initially, it started off as a way to predict stock prices. And because everybody designed, there is a limit to how much you can predict based on past data. Uh, and now because these algorithms themselves are democratized, uh, everybody has the same you know, algorithm that does prediction. The next natural step that they took it forward is by designing a program that can also do the trading work for you. So earlier, you know, years ago, if you looked at a stock market, if you looked at a stock exchange, you would have people all over the floor who are trying to bid trades, who are trying to make sales and purchase things, uh, stocks that are, you know, currently trading. But now what you have is these same people, they are now sitting in their offices and on their computers, they're running programs that will examine the current price of any stock in the market. It will see okay, is this according to my prediction? My prediction is that it will go higher. Uh, so I will purchase it now and I will sell it once it's higher. So that's what they would do. And uh, what we, I, although I don't have the particular domain expertise to talk about uh, what would, how would you set up an algorithmic trading setup in various parts of domains, but I can talk about uh, as an engineer, if there is an economist, if there is, uh, somebody with this background, you know, with uh, this sort of major who can guide me into how, what to build, then I can know how it can be built. So let's not dive too much into what this programming knowledge of these requirements are. Let's talk about, say, one example case that probably, uh, you know, you can also use uh, going ahead. So there is uh, one very typical case that you can say for uh, arbitrage opportunities. So uh, for anybody who might not uh, be familiar with the term itself, uh, arbitrage is when you actually, uh, if there is a particular stock that is listed on multiple exchanges at once, and uh, because there is uh, multiple exchanges may focus on different currencies and cur the relative price of currencies may change in a way 
that the stock is not is in in a way that is different than the stock change so you may find uh, it profitable to buy the same company stock from one exchange and sell it at another and you know pocket the the middle money so that would be an arbitrage and you know it is easy to today set up uh, just a quick you know uh, trading bot to do this so you know as an engineer how would i do this is that uh, i would simply need the two you know incoming price uh price streams the data stream from uh both stock exchanges so if i'm say in this example i'm talking about uh, american stock and london stock exchange now i will just need both their data i understand that uh american uh aex starts you know one hour before the british one so there is one hour of time when you know that uh stock option is fluctuating in its price and i can see if there is a difference between that and uh, london's and then i can go and make the sale so this is something that every people try to do at first and now what you have is you have multiple everybody is having these algorithmic trading bots and now the race is to build bots that can outsmart each other so people are no longer able to uh, compete with the speed and the accuracy that these bots can compete with now now the game is all about uh tuning these bots and tuning and you know maintaining them so i know that there are trading firms all over europe singapore uh even some in india that are maintaining big data analyst teams just to you know update these bots or these models so this is one good example i found for that talks about prediction as you know a use case uh let's just change gears a little bit to uh something we call detection so the second part would be finding something that is wrong with your current functioning now uh because people everything is digital now e money and e banking has now you know just become normalized uh it is now more easier for people to do say conventional fraud through credit card or even taxes or even you know trying to dodge uh payments through you know just all these online portals and gateways so this is uh one field that has really jumped up in these recent years because with the rise of fintech uh financial technology and um, so one very very typical uh use over here is that of detecting an anomaly in uh, any you know stream of transactions that keeps happening so i if just uh, to simplify this even further if you know i have a certain spending pattern uh every morning before going to work i buy one coffee and uh, at lunch i spend say approximately so much money in the cafeteria and before and while going home i spend so much for a cab now uh suddenly one day it is not even a saturday sunday it is it's a wednesday and suddenly in the morning i am spending a lot of money that is uh usually at the time when i sh i would normally go to work so this would be detected as an anomaly it is out of the ordinary so now what we have is we have systems that detect this on their own you uh you know your credit card you don't have to constantly be watching that oh my god something got deducted i have to inform my bank otherwise this will uh this will go off today banks uh even very very uh big banks or smaller banks are trying to do it they detect these anomalies on their own and they stop the transaction they ask you twice uh, you, some some of you might have noticed that you get multiple notifications not just that one otp whether we detected uh, an unusual transaction on your account uh, confirm if this is really you so this is that anomaly or fraud detection at work so uh, this is going to only improve because people are trying to outsmart these algorithms now those who are the fraudsters and uh, the banks and the people who need to maintain the integrity of their transactions they are also trying to improve so uh, again over here you know as uh, somebody who would be looking at these patterns and trying to identify changes in these patterns this is something that you would be interested in okay and now it's not just you know uh, your transaction history that people are looking at they are also looking at your ip your physical location because now your gps is linked to your mobile number or your phone and uh, whether they look at they check device whether you know the um, 
the ID of the phone number that the transaction was made under, whether that is the same or if it's different, because a person won't normally change their phone overnight for just one transaction. So these are some things that uh, are really going to be improving even more in the future. And that brings us to our final point, final uh, use case, which is uh, we did, we touched upon prediction, detection, and finally we'll talk a little bit about recommendation. And recommendation is something that started originally, you know, with uh, what is now known as the Netflix problem, because Netflix, which started a little over around 10 years ago, is that is they are what we normally consider in industry as the first pioneer of the recommendation system. So what tells you based on what you've already seen, Netflix recommends you what you might like. Right. You might see a small number over there, 94%, 60%, 80%. That is Netflix's algorithm or their system that says that, okay, this Netflix thinks that you are an 80% match. Uh, your viewing patterns, according to your viewing patterns, you might like this with a chance of 80%. Uh, if it's 94%, they're very confident that you are going to like it because it is exactly the kind of things that you watch, be it say you like horror or crime, mystery, thrillers and those things. And now that revolution was taken over by Amazon. And now retails are trying to do that everywhere. Uh, it is one of the best ways to compete with big tech. And, uh, what we are seeing now is, uh, we have already seen some examples of NLP natural language processing, uh, such as the example that I showed earlier, uh, I'll share a link with everyone soon. And, uh, we already know that product reviews, if uh, your decisions are based on how the reviews for anything are when you're shopping online, uh, your purchase history, if you've been purchasing a lot of something, it will show you more of it. And uh, also this is something that uh, big companies such as Facebook and uh, Google can you know, use is that your social media activity, because they have access to that data. Um, they can check those things. Now, uh, this has led to, you know, various, uh, gray areas and scandals where, you know, uh, unrestricted or even, uh, data that people were not, had not explicitly given permission for was being sold. So this is where, you know, uh, this is the source or the motive behind uh, those activities is that they are trying to sell your data to ad companies so that they can leverage your social media data to sell you better things. And finally, is uh, it's a very benign thing, but it has now come into uh, the global attention is that of uh, web analytics or cookies. Now, every time you visit a new website, you're reading an article, uh, you will find a cookie policy that is pops up now. They keep asking you uh, whether this site has a certain policy for storing cookies. Do you agree to it or do you not agree to it? Now, I'm sure if you're like me, uh, you will just not have, you know, use the headache, just say okay to everything. But what you're saying okay to now is something that came from uh, a European Union Committee for Data Integrity and Data Security. Um, uh, the exact name of the organization is, is, is not on the top of my tongue, but uh, what they did is that they directed the industries of the world that if you're going to use cookies, this cookie is basically, it's basically a program that the website installs on your web browser. Uh, my computer, if I'm going to amazon.com or if I'm going to Facebook, Facebook will install a cookie into my computer's temporary files and it will, and it will, that cookie will store all the things that I have done that Facebook cannot store on their servers. And the next time I open on this computer, it will read that file and it will uh, give me personalized information based on that. So this was done without user consent until just a few years ago when, you know, uh, it was mandated that you have to declare what your cookie policy is and how you're using a person's data, whether you're going to see what they are seeing on the website, where they're, what sites they're visiting, etc. So this has become very important now. And, um, just to give you a taste of what is upcoming in the future is among with these is research that we're seeing on dynamic pricing. Now, this is not a new thing. Uh, we, there is always, you know, relative change in prices on Uber. You see something called surge pricing or on Ola as well. But, uh, now what is happening is because you have so much personal specific data on a person, 
to maximize the chance that if a person is even browsing anything uh that they will feel like buying it is that you change the price to that price that the person is willing to buy it while maximizing your profit so that is something that is going to come on to amazon where you will soon find where different people are experiencing different prices uh on you know their different accounts and people might say that that is bizarre but uh, it is going to be so subtle that you know you will not even notice and uh, similar things are going to come up to you know improve productivity and also applications in retail and uh, finally i will leave everyone with just this uh, one little futuristic uh, model which is something that we we call predictive behavior modeling and um, you know for all the applications so far in retail or something this relates to retail but um, although uh, with uh, we were using limited amount of data with say customer data pricing data but there is no we don't know the the user as a person now what companies are doing is that they are trying to create an entire personality map of the person and right from social media to what they are doing to what they're interacting with and uh, although the ethics or the legality of this is still under question because laws for this are not in place yet uh what is going to happen is that at least big tech companies are going to be able to have a complete profile of their user uh, right from how they feel about various things their ideals and their value systems to predict how they will behave to certain uh, to certain stimulus so this they might use this in many ways whether it be ads or whether it be showing you certain content or it be anything uh what they might do with that data is again out of the scope of the discussion but uh this is something that is coming in the future so this is something that you can watch out for okay so that concludes uh the talk for today and uh, i think there might be a few more questions so let's just take them uh Santosh sir, if you have noted any questions, please uh, feel free to relay them. Or if anybody has any thought or question, just uh, feel free to unmute and just uh, yeah, ask away. Uh, uh, may I ask a question? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Uh, I am Anand Deshpande. actually uh, you know uh, uh, since we are in a lockdown um, for phd purpose and some uh, writing for some other research papers mm -hmm. we use google forms okay so google ala gave it uh, free and all our data is there so how safe is that right uh, i've been noticing a lot of these questions pertain to data security uh, which is very important and uh, so let's just uh, i'll let's touch a little bit upon that maybe we can have uh, a short follow up session on how uh, data integrity and data security uh, maps with you know all of these technologies so let's talking about uh, the integrity of forms the uh, the way that i cannot speak for uh, on google's behalf on how the internals of their systems work but the way that we understand it is that uh, google as a company create services that um branch off that are branched and yet interconnected amongst each other so if you are using forms uh there there are certain functions where uh the creator of the form can request or can mandate that uh, the filler of the form has a google account uh this can be done for google meet also yes, uh, you yes. can schedule a meet where if the person doesn't have a google, gmail account they cannot attend the session yeah yeah that's so correct so the integrity of the person's identity or the sort of data that they are sharing is currently linked to the person when they are sharing it with you so yeah. say if you are a person who is who has created a basic feedback form for yeah. anything and uh, you are sharing it in the public yeah. and you are looking at responses but you do not know if uh, anybody who you have shared it to in your internal group they yeah. takes the link and post it on social media and any person with say ill intent may try to write uh you know damaging or you know even say you know use inappropriate language in that form mm -hmm. i think that can be perceived as a possible uh, example of say you know misuse of the mode the medium mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Now here again, uh, you can, as a user, you can try to create checks, put in checks and balances where you request that the user's information is declared to you. If yeah. say it's an email ID or it's a name. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it all depends on how open you want to keep things. And, um, like I think, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's there, but how safe it is. It is, uh, not, uh, used and given to some other agency. Like I have heard about Cambridge Analyst and um, Mr. Donald Trump's connection and all. Correct, correct. I think we were talking about Cambridge Analytica and uh, the Facebook scandal. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, it is a bit of a tangent to the discussion here, but sure, uh, let's just talk a little bit about it. So to give you some uh, background about it, what happened is that Facebook uh, was using what is currently known is that Facebook was using customer user data of profiles onto uh, of people that have accounts on Facebook and without their explicit content, Facebook was taking that data and giving it to Cambridge, which was selling that to ad agencies, or it was an agency that was selling it to others. Now to an ad company, uh, the user's data of somebody who is in the United States might be important, but uh, basically what happened is that uh, Facebook was not, although it was fine, uh, it was not completely in the wrong because there are no rules and regulations in place that prevents Facebook from taking your data without telling you clearly. Now Facebook has to constantly tell you that, uh, do you consent to sharing your data? It is the same thing. Uh, if I'm talking about Google's forms, if you consent to it anywhere that yes, I'm okay with my data being used for, uh, you know, say improving Google's algorithms. So you have to be careful about, uh, you know, privacy policy and uh, certain uh, permissions that you give to apps when you allow. So every time you click on an allow and deny button, uh, what you have to understand is the implication behind the text. And uh, the text might typically say that, you know, your data will be anonymously used to improve our uh, systems. But mm-hmm. what that can also mean is that they will take your data and they will just sell it or they will sell it to a subsidiary company. And they will say that, yes, subsidiary company is making the system that, uh, is, you know, improving our product. But then again, there is no regulation on what the subsidiary company can do with your data. So the best thing I can tell you is to be careful whenever you give permissions to apps, when you're linking them to Google. Yeah. One. One more question. Uh, sure. May I go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, actually, uh, our Dr. Santosh Patel is always available uh, to us with those matters. I just had come across one matter in the morning, right. and uh, that was like uh, I was sending in the research paper, hmm. and uh, the concern university requested me to take a, a plagiarism report from online website. Okay. Now, I uploaded it. Then the website said. The research paper has to be of uh, 1,500 words. My was 1,900 words. So I had to go to another website and all that. I was not feeling very comfortable, but ultimately there were some changes in the paper. And again, if at all I upload it, then uh, what will be the status of plagiarism? Because um, uh, even uh, Patil sir also in one of his lecture alerted us to not to use online uh, websites for plagiarism check. And uh, I uh, some some of my colleagues also told me like uh, the paper is maybe already stored by the website. So if at all you again generate a plagiarism report, it will come like a hundred percent plagiarism. So uh, could you throw some light on this? Okay. So uh, about the initial part of what you mentioned is that um, it is likely that the site has already stored your paper in their system. Uh, if the site is functioning properly, if you know, uh, as intended, if the site is functioning where you have created, say, an account on the site, I'm not sure how it works, but uh, if you have done that and you have uploaded the first iteration of your paper through that account, uh, the site has probably possible, if it is storing the paper, it is it has likely linked that paper, that information to you. So the next time you upload the paper, uh, the site will understand that, okay, it is a hundred percent match with this data entry, but that is the same person that has shared the paper earlier. So a properly functioning, uh, plagiarism checker will have that check and balance in place. Uh, but otherwise maybe possibly what you could be 
you need to be concerned about is uh, that you were feeling uncomfortable with is that uh, before releasing your publication to uh, your paper to any proper publication or a conference or a journal uh, the site may get access to the the raw text and that text or that information may be misused that is a real possibility now for that uh, you may have to check the privacy policy of the website or what they are seeing whether what is uh, they are legally bound to disclose whether or what they do with the data now uh, it is best not to you know uh, crack your head behind all this because uh, you will you will be looking as much as you can and still not find an answer the best thing you can do is uh go to only those services that are mandated by or that are checked and cleared by certain re- reputed organizations or say your conference if you are posting to a journal or a conference and that journal conference has approved so and so plagiarism checkers hmm. then it is best that you check with them uh, otherwise it is yeah i would be skeptical about using others okay thank you so much yeah no worries okay Uh, are there any other questions from the group no there are no questions in chat box but i will request uh, uh, hello sir hello, i sir. even have can i can I ask one question i'm suryakant pagare from pudar college sure sure there are a few people coming so let's okay. just go in line uh, suryakant ji yes please go please go ahead uh, what are the prerequisites for python programming and how it is useful in academic research thank you okay right uh, let me see if i can pull up uh, a quick slide for this let's see um just a moment okay uh, i have one particular slide that i think might be uh, good for sharing over here so let me just pull that up okay so your uh, what we have is basically python programming is something that um, has been it's so commonly used right now it is and the evolution of it has just made it be completely ubiquitous amongst you know all sorts of fields and you know you don't just have technical people who are using it but also analysts accountants and what is the best most impressive part is that kids are able to learn it now if you are teaching a child programming uh, there is a more typical there is a more primitive level of programming say called scratch or something but uh, the next big language that they are able to learn is python and that is because it is absolutely easy to understand uh, it is what you call a high level syntax language now what that means is that coding in python is because all the complicated things that usually happen inside a programming language uh, such as you know your knowledge about da- memory management or you know data handling etc python handles all that internally you just have to tell it what you want to do so your uh, knowledge is very very close to you know uh, say writing it in english for example so that is why it is popular even amongst people who do not have you know technical background uh say in computer science or it where you know you have not had a class in knowing computer architecture or you haven't had any session where uh, they talk about what is a memory address uh, how can you handle pointers you know because uh, pointers in a programming language and being a little specific here they originate from knowledge about memory addresses in a computer and that comes from knowledge of how computer architecture is and uh, how data is stored you know within say any uh, memory drive so that knowledge is not required in python you do not need you know do not need to know that you only need to know how to write a piece of code for the thing you want to do and just go for it so uh, to summarize the answer for your question is that technical prerequisites are extremely less for python uh, basically background in if you are 10th grade or 12th standard level mathematics is fresh you are good to go i would say it is that uh, easy to start with okay i hope i've answered your question there are various reasons why python is popular but this is the biggest one out of them my one more question was sir uh, it's academic relevance uh, 
academic research relevance? How it is relevant? Is it useful in academic research? Absolutely. In fact, um, Python is one of the f- languages that is used a lot in uh, doing quick uh, prototyping and doing quick simulations in sort of in academic research. Now, the reason for that is that unlike other languages, you do not have to worry about uh, you know big uh, library constraints or making many things. Now, with the big with the large community that is already there, there are libraries in place that will help you quickly set up your program. And in research, uh, depending on the type of research you're doing, but uh, even if it comes to machine learning research, uh, which might not be your uh, imagined uh, this thing uh, uh, application, but uh, even there, Python is now completely used. Now, uh, regardless of what the field is, if you are trying to do any sort of simulation or any sort of writing scripts to test your hypothesis, that is where Python is absolutely being uh, optimized for that, and it is being used a lot. So I would say it is in the top rankings in popularity. Let me show you a quick graph that uh, talks about that. In fact, uh, this slide over here talks about how Python has grown in popularity over the last, uh, you know, just eight years, and it has because as a new language on uh, all the question and forum boards. You, people are using Python all over the world and across the board. So usage, growth, and queries on you know uh, sites like Stack Overflow, which deal with questions about programming languages, uh, they are just saying that Python is going to be is going to go overshoot in the next years, and it is going to be the most popular one. Yeah. Uh, th- does that answer your question? Thank you. I got my answer. Sure. Okay. Uh, there was another question we had in uh, from the chat. We have time to answer one, one two more people. Uh, good morning, sir. There's a question from my side. Can yeah. I go ahead? Yes, Karishma ji. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, you spoke about the cookies thing. Hmm. So, in, uh, suppose if I want that document, uh, unless and until I accept that cookie, that document will not open. So in that case, what should I do if I want to have an access to the document? So should I go and accept it? Because as you say that you have to be, uh, you know, a little particular when you are accepting uh, these things. Even uh, the question which was asked by the sir earlier regarding the apps, you know. So unless and un- until I agree to the policy, there are certain features which I will not be able to access it, you know. Right. So how do we go about in that? Okay, so I think uh, if I understand your question correctly, you want to understand how we can minimize our exposure to cookies whilst using various features of any application, any online application. I hope yeah, that's correct. Online application at the same time, any uh, re- maybe I'm reading a particular document or anything mm-hmm. which is on the uh, Google which is available, which also says that you need to accept cookies, you know, so how, uh, how to go about in that. Right. Okay, so the thing with cookies is that um, cookies usually work as a, uh, it depends on the the online product that your service has created. Now, uh, if your service is critically dependent on the cookie to work on the web, then that, uh, you know, that service provider will make it clear that, you know, if you want to use the website, you need to accept to this. This is the policy. If it's okay with you, if you are if you are willing to uh, give your data to use the service, then please accept and you can go ahead and use it. But uh, if you don't want to share your data, if you don't want to store cookies on your computer, then the program won't work or we are denying service and then you won't be able to use it. So it is completely an op. It is now become an opt-in thing where you have to say. Earlier, the case, which the case was that first your data was taken and then they would ask for permission. Now they cannot do that. They have to ask for permission before taking your data. So, uh, and com- businesses, companies, they reserve the right to deny service if that data is not available. But uh, typically in 80, 80 to 90% of cases, you will see that if you take a little bit of effort to examine the cookie policy or reject, just reject the cookie, uh, the site can still work. You can still use the website or you can you can use the functions. So you just have to be a little more vigilant when you open new websites and uh, in the pop-up or the dialogue that they declare, you just have to click on say manage settings 
uh, read through it is they don't give you a very big text i feel uh, i have tried it a few times and you can typically just choose to opt in or out of certain features and uh, you should be good to go otherwise if you are too worried about it you can just go to your browser settings and uh, delete all the cookies that are in your browser and uh, that will also solve your problem as well but uh, you will have to keep doing that or instruct your browser that uh, not to store cookies at all so yeah that's it it's just a local thing okay sir thank you so much okay all right yeah uh, if there are no uh, major questions i think uh, we are quiet over time and in fact uh, we have also overshot our original uh, buffer time so uh, santosh sir before we close can i just request uh, dr kadam from our side to give a few closing arguments yes sir please go ahead please. yeah yeah uh, good afternoon everybody i hope i hope i am audible uh, yes sir you are yeah okay please. okay uh, in the first place let me thanks uh, dr uh, honorable principal uh, honorable vice principal and dr santosh patil for, for allowing us this opportunity to present ourselves uh, in the domain of data, data science actually so akshat uh, actually looks after the technical aspects of our company and uh, i am more into looking after the business part of it uh, that is the marketing etc i just like to share a simple th uh, a thought that uh, when data science came in somewhere around akshat would say 2012 but uh, it started ga gaining traction in india from 2016 when you know a little bit of traction was there people were hearing about data science now it's become like a wildfire like everybody knows what data science is so at, at that moment of time i used to always think that uh, data science what has it got to do with commerce what has it got to do with commerce but now currently what i am seeing is that there is a huge explosion Uh, i would say commerce is the best field where data science can be used especially in the bfsi sector uh, if you look at the uh, current com uh, bfsi companies we got around 400 listed companies uh, across india office 200 are based in mumbai so that uh, gives the sorts of opportunities uh, for uh, students uh, to really you know pick up this domain and use it in this particular sector as you would all agree that the bfsi sector is the booming thing as of now so uh, from that perspective i would like to uh, close my statements i would like to tell you that uh, us teachers have been a very good audience and uh, i would really appreciate the fact that uh, if the same can be you know passed on to the students to let them know that okay fine uh, you can use data science to leverage your uh, domain knowledge and uh, get and uh, you can get better jobs or you can you know even go for a startup actually okay, thank you thank you very much yes uh, thank you doctor so for the uh, purposes of the chat i have also uh, just posting the link of uh, the original video that i had mentioned earlier today yeah during the that could not play the audio okay uh, that's just that so thank you doctor and uh, i would also like to thank uh, all the administration and madam principal for uh, conducting this session and before we just close one final small share is that tomorrow we are convening once again for uh, a similar talk on uh, a slightly different field and uh, this is with respect to xr which is uh, a blanket term for ar and vr and its role in education so we are also handling initiatives on this front and we would really appreciate if uh, you will also attend tomorrow session which is going to be in a different flavor and probably a little more enjoyable to watch and you might find it more exciting okay that's all from us thank you yes santosh sir over to you thank you thank you akshit sir uh, doctor uh, thank you dr kadam sir uh, for giving us this wonderful you know session uh, we have touched upon various issues about you know the alga this ai and the data analysis it's uh, your lesson and its history and its impact on various you know fields so i think this uh, presentation was uh, outstanding all of us have got some knowledge uh, of this concept and i think i will definitely use them in our day to day and professional activities also okay uh, now uh, i will request our uh, uh, faculty dr amruta patil ma'am to propose vote of thanks on this occasion Dr. Amrita Patil. Yes. Yes. Good morning, all of you. Yes. Good morning. Express vote of thanks on behalf of S. P. Mandalis, Arya Bhudar College of Commerce and Economics, 
I thank uh, Mr. Akshat Kadam for hosting the program technically and sharing with us how we can use uh, AI and machine learning in commerce. We are also happy to uh, hear that our students have the opportunity in this field. I also thank uh, Dr. Sanjay Kadam for sharing his views. Uh, thank you, Patil sir, for organizing this program. I also express my sincere thanks to our principal, Dr. Shobhna Vasudevan, madam, for understanding the need of R and uh, promoting such kind of uh, faculty development programs. Uh, I also thank our vice principal, uh, Kavita Jaju, and all my colleagues and all the attendees. Thank you all.